Lead, lead, lead. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours. I'm Simon, your reluctant host but enthusiastic interviewer. Now, I have been low level dreading this intro as it's really hard to guess at whereabouts I need to be pitching myself. Who, if anyone is listening to me, what is turning them on or off about me? I have no idea. I just don't have the data. I initially wanted this show to be all about my guests, but I'm a bit of a fool and have either been outright lying to myself or slightly fooling myself. If I'm presenting, I need to have a presence here. The question is how much. I still want to keep my interest short, but I will be starting to try to put in a bit more context and relevant information into them because I need to. I need to for the show, for the listeners and for the guests. I do care about the curation of these interviews and about the presentation of my guests, so I need to try harder on this front. This medium may demand bags of ego and self-promotion, but I don't think that that has to override the fact that this show, my show, is at its very core about getting that sample, getting those 1,000 loiners and doing that across this decade. Hearing those thoughts, your thoughts, of the people in every role, in every social class, in every stage of their development. Those thoughts... Your thoughts leaked. Whether the loiners I get to speak to are still in the workforce or have given up on it altogether, whether they are retired or apprentices, whether they're in work or between jobs, whether these are loiners who do unpaid labour or loiners who are not allowed to work for whatever reason, all the demographics, the boxes, the labels, the marketing profiles and journalistic types that make up this city, your city, my city, our city, I want to hear from you, Leeds. Getting this snapshot of leads, getting a representative snapshot of leads, is so important to me. I don't just want to talk to office workers or people online. I want to talk to leads, to you, to hear your thoughts, feelings and ideas. I want to do this throughout this decade. A decade that I see is so very, very important and that I feel will be so very, very crazy. I do really hope our species can stop making everything worse for itself and can finally start to grow up. And I do really hope that we can do that within this decade. I know that that is possible, but sadly I don't really believe it will happen. But other people do, or they aren't bothered about any of that, and that's what I think is so important to capture. We are a year into this decade, and it has already changed so much. Okay, so enough cynicism from me for now, but I did think it was very important to stress that this is trying to be a show about leads and for leads, a show about work led by workers, and to be a show that represents the diversity of our city in the 2020s. So if you're on universal credit, get in touch. If you're on zero hours, get in touch. If you're working in the Arctic for six months, get in touch. If you're in jail, get in touch. Whatever the hell it is you do, if you are from Leeds or you are in Leeds and you have an opinion on work and working, I want to record it and publish it. I want to create a record of how we succeeded or failed when it came down to the crunch. Right, so now that that is out of the way, this is episode one of volume two, 2020 of Working Hours. This episode is from a conversation that I had last month. My guest here is Steph Farley, who is the founder and director of INC360, a fascinating startup that I think has loads and loads of potential. You can find out more about INC360 at www.inc and then the numerals 360.org. You can contact INC360 for further information on volunteering and fundraising, social responsibility and sponsorship, press and speaking slots and healthcare collaborations. They're well worth checking out, so do have a look at the website. Steph also has a day job, and we discussed that too. I'm going to leave the intro here for now, as I have talked enough about this already. So I will develop these intros going forward to have a bit more detail in them. I've got five episodes coming out over the next few weeks. Obviously, there will be more if I get more guests. So, loiners, hit me up and tell me how good, bad or balanced your work is or how you think everyone must toil and suffer for work to be work or if you think that no one should have to work or any position in between those. Okay, apologies to Steph for underselling her here and promoting myself. Also, I should point out that any of my views are always my own and are not necessarily and probably not at all endorsed by any of my guests. With that said, let's get into it and hear from someone far more interesting than me. What did you want to be when you grew up? 
I wanted to be a couple of things actually. Um, I started out really early wanting to be a vet. I absolutely loved everything to do with animals and learning about nature. Um, and yeah, up until probably the age of about 10, I was set on being a vet. Yeah. Do you have a little bit even now? I still kind of want to be a race car driver. I mean, right. I've not done any training for it. I'm definitely not on that path, but okay. it's still there. Maybe one day. <laughs> so why the race car driving? What got you into that? Just like driving fast. And I've got a lot of speeding tickets. So I feel like, you know, <laughs> turn a negative into a positive. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So what, what do you do now? So I do a couple of things now. Um, I have my own company, which is a community interest company called Inc. 360. Um, and that's, well, we're in the very early stages, but we're developing a service to help young people who might be facing situations of loneliness or isolation, just to kind of help promote a positive mental health and give them a chance to experience events going on in the city in a digital format. Um, and that's kind of on the side of my full time job, which is as an executive assistant at the Data Shed, which is based mm-hmm. in Leeds. And um, I've been there for about two and a half years now. OK, um, so how many times have you had to do the pitch for your own company at this point? Quite a few, and it, I'm sure it changes every time. <laughs> yeah. What do you think is your best pitch? Is it a, a really short one or a longer form version of it? I feel like it's the version in my head is very short, but then I yeah. feel like five minutes later, I'm still explaining it. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think I need to work on just making it a little bit more punchier. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it, it, it's sort of because there's a lot of information to kind of get out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is quite easy to understand as well in terms of you're using these platforms to to create inclusivity for people and then various other systems. Yeah. Yeah, you've done a better job of explaining it than I <laughs> You've made it very nice and succinct. <laughs> well, I've got a similar one with sort of, oh, I'm doing a podcast, it's on work. Well, that doesn't really tell anybody anything, but yeah. that's kind of the point as well. Um, because, you know, as I've said before, whatever you're interested in, whatever's going on in terms of human activity, someone's working on it. Mm-hmm. So someone's doing it somewhere. Yeah. So exactly. it gives me a great, area you know I can cover anything just with that topic definitely yeah and I bet you do you must speak to all different kinds of people uh certainly like I'm hoping this year will be a a lot more of that and sort Mm. of covering more different areas um there seems to be a couple of themes they're kind of repeating at the moment Mm um kind of like new tech and sharing economy sort of stuff seems to come up quite regularly um so I expect that to continue, but then sort of other roles to come in as well. And people, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I'm hitting anyone outside of that yeah. little little bubble that I've created at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So um, the day job, mm-hmm. your non-businessy job, how long have you been doing that one for? So I've been working there for close to two and a half years now. Um, I originally started there as a PA, moved into an EA position, and then most recently, just at the end of last year, um, I've now been moved into an employee engagement and office management role. So I'm just finding my replacement now as a PA, handing that over, and then I'll be actually moving into a new role within that company. So do you get any downtime then with having a sort of full-time job and then starting your own business? Are you just working constantly at the moment, or how is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I tell people I'm having downtime when they ask me about it. But yeah, I tend to be, if I'm not doing work, I'm probably thinking about work. Um, but yeah, I think I've come into this this year just being a little bit more relaxed. And I think those first couple of years starting a business, there is just so much to do. And I think there's so much pressure to make sure that you commit to it and get it off the ground that now I feel like I've, I've done that bit. Mm-hmm. I can now relax a little bit and just look at it almost like from an outside point of view, um, rather than being in, being it all day, every day, trying to get all the fundamentals sorted out. So, yeah, there is yeah. a little bit more time now than there was over the last few years. Okay. And you, you've you got, um, so this is an, another person working with you. Is that just a, a, an additional colleague or are they part of the co-founding or are they just giving you sort of support in delivering your mission or what, what's their role? 
So originally I had a, a co-director who's now left the company, but I'm now working. So I've just hired three placement students. So they're, they're doing a placement for between one month and three months. Um, I've got two of them in a research position. So they're helping to just develop the research that we're going to need to pilot the service and understand a little bit more about technology and how it's used in you know in a health setting or in a social yeah. setting and then um the third person that i've brought in is going to be supporting me from a mental health point of view of delivering the workshops and making sure that the information we're sharing with young people is age appropriate and is actually true um yeah because I- I'm not trained I'm not a therapist I've got mental health first aid qualification so I've got an understanding of it but I'm not in mm-hmm. the position to be giving that you know okay. therapeutic advice so. so where did you do your mental health first aid was that through your other work that you mm-hmm. sort of did the course and then mm-hmm. right okay yeah um, I did the data shed yeah they they wanted to have people um for the staff to go to and talk to us so that was actually a qualification that they let me go on for t- a food mm-hmm two-day qualification and I do that as a part of my role at the data shed as well. Okay so is there is there a pathway from that then did you kind of did this idea did the INC 360 idea come out of you doing that mental health training and then the subsequent work or you think that was maybe a direction you were heading in anyway? I think a little bit of both to be honest I think it definitely contributed to it um, I think it was something that I was already interested in, but being able to go and do a course on it and then better understand it and realise that I actually wanted to learn more, it almost sparked that interest and made me realise how broad it is as well. So I think it probably did trigger those thoughts mm. to go and maybe pursue something like that. I'm not sure where the technology side comes into it. I think maybe that's just just seemed right at the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you're working in kind of a tech environment anyway, mm. by the sounds of it with data. Yeah. So I guess that you, you'll have met a lot of people, mm-hmm. some of which have been useful, some of which have been useful for referrals and so on. But, mm-hmm. And I would imagine that you're going to private businesses, public services, and then health providers, and mm-hmm. then youth groups or something like that. How have you approached the, the kind of children side of things? Yeah, so we've I've tried to kind of contact as many people as possible during the first year, especially because it was all new to me. So I was just reaching out to people and saying, look, I've got this idea. I'd really like your advice or just to talk to you and understand what services are available and if there's anything like this already out there. Um, so I did start by contacting um, hospices, community groups, youth groups. Um, we've talked to people in like scouts and beavers, that kind of thing. Um, And then we also had a meeting with Leeds Children's Hospital just to understand again. I was very aware of saying this is my idea and I don't want to run off on a tangent when actually the person at the end, it's so far from what they would want. So I went and talked to the Children's Hospital and said, like, look, if I was to develop a service, what do I need to do to get through the door with Uh these kids and actually help people? What would you be looking for before I start designing and, you know, planning everything? Um, so that was really useful because that's something that I want to definitely work towards in the future. The whole idea behind the business was to help children in hospital. So there's obviously other other ways that we can help people, but that is kind of my end goal, I guess. So yeah, just just reaching out to people, dropping them an email, um, yeah. and basically just saying I'd love to have a chat and understand your service, and maybe there's something that could align with that or complement what you're already doing. Uh-huh. Um, so was there any point where you I mean, did you have the kind of VR headsets and this kind of immersive stuff already in mind or did that come through your process of seeing what you could deliver? No, I, do you know what? I didn't even have a headset myself. So it's really strange that it kind of came about. But um, I know when I said it, I remember coming home to my boyfriend and saying, I've got this idea. And he was like, I have no idea where you've got that from. It sounds crazy. But there you go. Um, yeah, it kind of, I mean, it came about because I was planning an event a, a, a part-time job that I had at the time when you say do I have downtime now when I talk about it I'm like absolutely not <laughs> I had a full-time <laughs> job and a part-time job and then I started a business at the same time God. but yeah when I was working the part-time job I was planning an event and I really wanted to have like this charitable part to it and be able to reach children that might not be able to enjoy other events going on and that's when it kind of triggered my thought into into just thinking about all these kids that don't have access and the reasons why they don't have access then I thought well why don't we record the event 
and then we can give them access in that way. And it just kind of stemmed from there. Then I thought, well, how can we make sure it's realistic? And maybe if they had a headset, they could feel like they were exploring the area. Um, and it just kind of went from there. And then I just started looking further into immersive technology and VR and video. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that kind of just came out of nowhere, really. I would imagine that you've done or come across at least sort of literature that talks about dealing with kids with different learning abilities or disabilities mm -hmm. and like different sensations and different ways into engaging with the world. Mm -hmm. How much of your offer has had to make a lot of adjustments for that kind of thing or is it is that is there like a blanket service that you would use for people with with tweaks to it or do you mm -hmm. sort of tailor make it for for each individual? To be honest, that's what we're kind of trying to figure out now. So at the minute, we're planning to do a pilot in April and, and just get it in front of people and understand what people's needs are. So when we're doing the pilot, we're going to have almost like a blanket service. We're going to do six workshops, all exactly the same, but with different age groups and slightly different abilities. And then just see what resonates with people, the engagement levels, and if the content's right for that age group. And then want to try and kind of repeat that maybe in six months time but with more um, specialist groups whether that's children with special needs people with autism people in hospital you know there's various different ways that I can see this going but we're very much in a let's try it phase mm -hmm. at the minute and understand from them what they want from us. So let's go back a bit so I'm guessing that you uh, you're still working from home the majority of the time even mm -hmm. with both these roles. Yeah. Okay. So when we went into lockdown originally last year, mm -hmm. there must have been, I mean, I know I had moments of just like, oh, well, I can't do that. My initial plan was I, I was where I could, I was going around to people's houses and sort of recording there oh, that's cool. um, and have it a bit more intimate and sort of have them in their own territory. I mean, this is good because, you know, we're both in home, home ground sort of yeah. thing. So, um, but that was the initial idea was to sort of have it more directly face to face and then you know obviously my brain doesn't always work we went into lockdown I was like I can't do that anymore and then went yes I can I can do Skype <laughs> um, but there must have been that must have had an effect what kind of effect did the lockdown have on you were you sort of like I won't be able to do anything or did the adjustment happen quite easily because you know you already had that job in place that mm -hmm. gave you a pathway I guess of like this is how we're going to work so how how was that for you? I think I've been really lucky, to be honest, because the company that I work for, the data shed, we, you know, we didn't need to furlough anyone. Everyone still had a job. So that already in itself just took a lot of pressure off and gave me structure to my day already. So it was almost like I had one half of my life I didn't even really need to worry about. There was still obviously stress yeah. and anxiety about the news and you yeah. never know how the company is going to go. But at least that I could kind of compartmentalize my thoughts in that okay I've got this thing to focus on if the other stuff's not going right but with the business it I did go through a phase of just being really angry at COVID which I'm I'm sure yeah. lots of people are um just because I'd got it in my head that I'd registered the business in July and I'd tried to set myself some targets and I'd said by September I want to be running a a service a pilot service and just get it in front of people and then December I'm going to do this and I'd planned myself some milestones and none of them were going to happen. Yep. And I almost just window. like, yeah, it's like my first year in business. I'm already stressed. And now the things that I'm kind of clinging on to that, that I associate with the business being successful aren't there. And then I had mm -hmm. to kind of really take a step back and, and try and see the small wins and see that, okay, well, now this gives us a chance to do some more research or talk to mm -hmm. more people. And I might never have got in contact with the universities and found these placement students, which are now a massive part of my team and how we're going to move forward. So, yeah, there was this kind of transition period where I just had to take a step back um, mm -hmm. and sort that side out of my life whilst the other side was still going well. Yeah. Do you think I, two of the things that I think is that, you know, sort of starting in this it feels like it's a, a massive hurdle that and that it's unfair and that other people didn't have to face it sort of thing but then at the same time you know getting for me getting through that first year and most businesses failing in their first year kind of thing mm -hmm. is a little psychological milestone for me of like well I've done that first year yeah. and I did it in the 
in the pandemic mm-hmm. so it's like that that's got to count for something I think did you, did you feel any of that of like well I've got these wins at least yeah definitely <laughs> I think that's a really good point because even the first year is going to be tough but doing it through a pandemic is I think you've got to cut yourself a little slack and think yeah actually that was really difficult and you should be really proud of yourself and I think I guess the moment for me, we we did a crowdfunder that was successful. And I think that was the next big thing after we knew we couldn't do the, the pilot first face was focusing on that. And the day that we were successful in raising the money, I just cried my eyes out. And I think that was just like the last year of me putting pressure on myself. Yeah. That, that was almost like, oh, I feel like I've achieved something really big. And maybe that was the point when I just thought, OK, yeah, we can do this. We've got through the first year. We're still in a really crap global situation but I can see a little bit of of a future for this so yeah yeah, I think doing it through a pandemic is difficult anyway yeah well doing doing anything at the moment (laughs) yeah Yeah. even going for a walk I feel like I'm gonna get in trouble (laughs) well you also you also get sick of walking as well like oh should we we meet up for a walk yeah that'll make a change (laughs) yeah the same park like you can't go anywhere anyway it's not like you can go for a drive and go and see somewhere new Oh, yeah. what are you doing in your downtime then like do you have some things that you like to to do, do, do uh, I do a lot of pacing around my room <laughs> 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 but, and I need to get out of here um I, I I'm just trying to make myself kind of do things and keeping the goals sort of simple mm-hmm. mm. so yeah like I said I've got got to go back and sort of do a bit more on the first series and putting better show notes, putting some show notes. Um, and then I've got a couple of interviews that I've done recently that need editing to get those out. And I'm hoping, you know, I've kind of realized that with anything digital and social media wise, you, you mm-hmm. constantly have to be creating content. You have to constantly be putting stuff out. Uh, so I don't want to leave the gap between the series too long. But then mm. I don't want to just release four and then just, you know, really. so I want to get at least a certain number and then do them mm. in a batch. Ideally, if I can get to the point where I'm getting enough interviews, mm. um, I want to be at the point where I can release sort of two a week or something like that for this show. Mm. So that's my focus is just, you know, kind of concentrate on getting guests at the moment and mm-hmm. see how it goes. Um, but I know as well that, I'm limited because part of my plan was to be sort of visible because I'm doing something online, but it was important to me that it had a real world physical presence as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted I wanted it to, to be known within the city. So when I came up with the idea of, of work as this, the subject, I mean, I know quite, I, I've lived in various places so I know people around the world and I'm, I, I know some people who have got some very interesting roles and things like this. Mm-hmm. So I could have gone that route, but I specifically wanted to have this local real world geographic yeah. kind of connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if I'm running short of guests, I can literally, you know, I can ask the man in the street or the woman in the street because I'm there you know it's like I've got a card I'm a real person that's in front of you that's talking yeah. about things online rather than some someone or some entity contacting you online and saying no I'm a real thing look I just thought that would be a nicer way to do it because I know that I can build something although it's virtual physical here mm-hmm. but I can't control the space outside of that you know, yeah in sense it does yeah that makes perfect sense I think it's such a it's such a great idea as well because sometimes it's nice to listen to things but if if you can't relate to it in any way it's all you can sometimes forget it but I think being able to listen to people that you know are in your city or things that are going on around you and you can relate to it just resonates with you more yeah and I think it'd be interesting as well to show like I said to you before we've had quite you know there's been a couple of people that are IT and tech and sort of sharing economy and I want to get a lot more of that and see all the interesting things that people are doing and are involved in. But I want all the traditional roles as well. And I want mm-hmm. people who are, you know, maybe they're between jobs or something or they're thinking about the next step in their career. Because it's as much about how we think about work for ourselves mm-hmm. um, as because we don't talk about it, I think, as much as we should or in the ways that yeah. we should. 
and we spend a lot of time you know like the situation is that we're you know to, as a society we've chosen to spend most of our time with a bunch of strangers doing the thing that we didn't necessarily choose for ourselves yeah rather than with our family and friends that's yeah that's so bit, true it's a little bit strange mm. <laughs> yeah it is yeah. There's value in it. People obviously get value in it. And then a lot mm-hmm. of, you know, most jobs, especially when I was younger, when I was looking for jobs, the, the thing that I used to say to everyone was, you know, it's the people that are important. Like, as long as the people are good, I don't really mind what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that's obviously been taken away now because you've just got the job <laughs> and you've not got the people so much. Yeah, definitely. So what, what did you want to be when you were younger then? What would you say to uh, the job? I wanted to be a surgeon for a while um cool. and like pathologist because my mum mm-hmm. loads of murder programs and stuff oh wow wanted to be an astronaut obviously obviously uh, yeah that's a cool one to be a lot of training but it's really cool <laughs> and the main one that, that I had most of my life was to to be in film to be a film director or writer um oh, no but you know I ended up working in admin in offices instead <laughs> 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 but there's always it's a stepping stone there's always a route into it you yeah still want to pursue it yeah I, I mean I have done my I, I've done my own stuff and I've, I've worked on a couple of films you know like low budget films and stuff in mm-hmm. places so I've, I've got to do some of it but yeah but I'm kind of glad in some ways because I, I I'm, I'm quite into this now mm-hmm. I like the idea of this and I like this particular project I think it's got legs I think there's mm-hmm. uh, and I think it'd be useful for just kind of connecting other people as well yeah so definitely I, I don't know if this will necessarily stay in the recording but I was talking to someone yesterday and they're they're in the well-being field as well okay so it's like it, it's funny how things crop up like that if I yeah. well I just talked to someone yesterday <laughs> had a discussion about well-being so. yeah uh do you have any plans with INC 362 broaden I, I mean obviously this is that would be much further down the line but to broaden the scope of the services outside of children as well yeah potentially I think the way that we're kind of focused on it now is to just based off some of the statistics and things that I've learned about mental health a lot of mental health issues start before the age of 14 so one of the things that I really wanted to do is try and focus on preventative methods rather than dealing with people that already have a mental health issue obviously yeah there might be children that are already experiencing things and that's that's fine we can work with that but I think yeah starting before things happen in people's lives is quite important um, but I do see the service being able to support older people Um, I know there is quite a lot of like immersive tech and VR being used in elderly people and dementia care um, and physiotherapy for all different ages so yeah I think technology in general is being accepted across the field so there's no reason why we couldn't develop further. Yeah it might well I was going to say it might be easier at that level but it's probably not because you've always got the caveats about people with particular needs and Mm-hmm. like particular vulnerabilities and so on so in some ways mm-hmm. it's probably really good that you are focused on a specific group where you can kind mm-hmm. of encounter all of those problems first yeah and it out a bit so with the pilot how long are you, how long are the pilot schemes running for did you say so I'm just running it through April at the minute so I want to try and do six workshops with two different age groups mm-hmm. um, and then just kind of review where we've got up to in May and yeah to just see how it goes really originally I was thinking oh yeah we'll do a couple every every day and we'll we'll smash out all of these workshops and just thought well it's a lot of time um and it's a lot of effort on something that I don't know whether it works so I'd rather do yeah. some really focused sessions and get yeah. the most out of it and then we'll see in summer if the world opens back up again um what the possibilities are because as well I'm just very aware that even in April we might not be able to do things face to face but that's yeah. kind of planning for yeah but as uh, I imagine you are kind of you have some level of contingency for that in terms of like there's there's other stuff that I can get on with if we're still in lockdown and also like are you imagining new ways to kind of circumvent this kind of situation of like for example if we got another pandemic in the near future Mm -hmm. I mean the the distance between SARS-1 and 
this one yeah. it's not that massive mm-hmm. so if another one came up within the decade um obviously that we didn't have a vaccine for and that we were in a lockdown situation again mm-hmm. you now have some of that experience so are you are you kind of keeping this experience in your head or how, how are you planning for that mentally that's a really good question I'm not, I'm not sure I think I do I have it in my head as kind of what's going to happen maybe in the next year I mm. think I'm I'm trying not to maybe I'm just being really naive like not thinking any further past that um but yes I guess for the next couple of months we would just have to do stuff online um mm. I just don't think I've got the knowledge or the experience to be able to plan plan that far at the minute mm. I'm being honest well, I think it's really difficult to actually go to the planning stage because mm. it, it it's so changeable. You yeah. know, you're kind of, all oh, right, well, we're all outside. Oh, we're all back inside again. Yeah. <laughs> you're kind of like, well, I could do this thing, but I don't know what we're going to be doing then. So I'll probably, so you, you, you horizon for thinking ahead shrinks. Definitely. Yeah. Kind of... <laughs> it's all very gray, isn't it? I don't feel like there's a, okay, if this happens, we'll just do the opposite. It's like, but even if we did the opposite, we'd probably need to do it in a different way. I just feel like there's a whole rainbow of ideas and I'm mm. just not really sure which colour it's going to be in the next couple of months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's not, not easy. So um, I'll just go on to sort of other jobs before you did the the data shed one. Mm-hmm. Did, you, did you go... Like, what was your first job? Were you straight out of school or did you come from uni and then into a more professional job? Like, how did you get into the workforce? So I think probably the earliest job that I had was helping my mum. She had her own company um, doing like shoe and bag parties. So she'd go to people's houses, almost like the Tupperware parties, um, but with shoes and bags. So a lot of a lot of very happy women and a lot of Prosecco. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I used to I used to go with her then and I was probably 11 or 12 and I absolutely mm-hmm. loved it. I just loved the fact that I'd be able to finish school, do my homework and then it was almost like, you know, you're going out in the evening and yeah. I should probably go into bed, but I'm actually out selling shoes. It was, it was, there was a novelty <laughs> there. Um, so yeah, I used to help her with that and I used to go and if you needed things labelling, I'd sit for hours in the conservatory s- sticking shoe like labels on shoes and stuff mm-hmm. and just loved it. So that was probably my first job, and I got paid in shoes, funnily enough. <laughs> I would get to check <laughs> nice. shoes, and shoes. And then my first, I guess, proper job was working in Tesco when I was probably 15, 15 or 16. Mm-hmm. Um, went into just stacking shelves over a Christmas period. And then mm-hmm. from there, went into hospitality and catering. So I spent a good 10 years working in cafes, bars, events, mm-hmm. restaurants, and then did some odd jobs in between, like worked at a children's play centre done camp america so i've gone and worked with kids over a summer um, how was that studio it was so much fun mm. it's so much fun being a camp counselor you literally are just a kid for the whole of summer you tell a few kids off but the rest of the time you're just having fun and they really look up to you as well so yeah it's really nice i came away from that with feeling really good about myself i guess yeah it was a nice nice point because that was after i finished university uh, sorry before i went to university so i'd finished sixth form mm-hmm. uh, didn't really know what to do my school even brought my parents in to say she needs to go to university but she keeps telling us she's not going to go and I was just really stubborn even though I hadn't looked into any courses I was like just because you're telling me to do it I'm not doing it and they knew that it was best for me but I was like no I know myself you know (laughs) I'm 18 or whatever I was I'm 18 I know know. yeah of course (laughs) like I know that education is not for me so I went and I worked for half a year and then went and did Camp America for three months, came back and was just like, right, I'm going to university. I've decided I've made the decision in my own time. I'm doing it. So they were right. <laughs> it yeah. was definitely the right thing to do. Yeah. But, you know, it was right for you to come and make that decision for yourself, because if you'd just done it off the back of, well, I'm doing it because they told me to. Yeah. You wouldn't have the same ownership, you know, at least there. It's like, well, I've chosen to do this. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think it's interesting how you mentioned you, your mum there straight off and then you mentioned the working children's play centre or a creativity centre. Mm-hmm. So you sort of, you know, that initial job where you're going around with your mum and you're kind of creating community. 
Yeah. And then you you sort of you work in tech. You've had the experience with children. It's kind of the the connections. Yeah. You know, like everything true. falling into place of like, oh, well, these things are, are already in my past. If I join. Mm. Yeah, I didn't think about it like that. That's a really good point. I've never really thought back to the beginning yeah. of working life. So yeah, that's that's actually really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. well one of the questions that I considered throwing in there was sort of you know to ask people about what their parents did mm-hmm. because you know there's there was a point in time where people kind of just did what their parents did to a degree yeah. um, and you don't see that as much anymore but I think you know I think what your parents do still has an effect on your I- idea of things and as well that that job of your mum's it sounds like it sounds a bit Avon lady you know yeah, party-ish, sure. but you, you're effectively like it's a franchise but you're working for yourself yeah definitely yeah. yeah yeah it is like that and I think she I don't know even where she got the idea from I think she must have gone to a, a, a party with someone and then thought yeah I want to do this um, and I think she just wasn't happy in the job that she was in and kind of saw that as something a little bit flexible and something for herself and she just wanted to pursue it and I guess see what it was like to own her own business and kind of took that chance. And I guess for my dad, he's he was also self-employed at different periods. He's worked a lot as a contractor and he worked for the Halifax Bank for quite a long time. I think he was there for about 26 years as a, a, a management, quite high up position. Um, but then he did start his own business as well. So I've kind of seen it from both sides, but they were always both in work throughout my entire childhood like they were always doing something and quite work orientated um so I don't know whether maybe that's why I love work (laughs) yeah I and it 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 sounds like you know you you were potentially always destined to kind of go down the self-employed route Mm -hmm. so did did you see that for yourself or was it more a matter of you came up with the idea and then went right I'm going to do this as a business for myself or were you looking were you always sort of I'm going to go into business business for myself but I haven't Mm -hmm. found the idea yet which which way around or was it a bit of both probably a bit of both maybe more so the latter I think I'd always wanted to work for myself or have a business I, I almost saw it as quite a big challenge and I think I quite like that in thinking that if I had an idea I would really like to see something really from the ground up and really yeah. fully understand it learn I love to learn so learning everything about it and then yeah. just see where it goes rather than you know when you join a company you've got to learn all the history of it and sometimes you feel a little yeah. bit connect, disconnected from it I think it, it's that almost appealed to me in thinking this is my idea and I get to see it see it develop and grow and decide what happens with it that was quite appealing yeah I, I mean you haven't you haven't chosen anything easy <laughs> 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 so yeah. um I mean did you uh, there must be points where you've had doubts in in the journey not just with the lockdown and so on but there, there must have been you know lows with the highs what what's been the most difficult thing has it was it the lockdown that was the biggest sort of hurdle yeah I think so I've definitely had those points where I just think what am I doing? I could just be eating Ben and Jerry's and watching Netflix. Mm. Why have I chosen to make all my evenings and weekends full? But then I kind of, I don't know. I think maybe, maybe if I wasn't working in like a community focused business, um, sorry, with um, incoming, there's almost that pressure now that I feel like, okay, I've said I'm going to do this thing. I need to do it because mm. there is a real need for it. And it, it is for a good cause. It's not like I'm just doing it to make, money and I think maybe that would have been a lot easier to walk away from if I'd have just thought you know what this isn't worth it because it's not going to affect anyone else I'm only putting myself in this position now I've learned about the different needs and all the different ways that this could help someone I feel really emotionally invested in it so I think that's that lifts me out of it a little bit if I do get to the point where I'm like no I'm done I'm sick of doing this I'll just kind of look back at the people that I've talked to and I'm like nope keep going because it's for a good cause Okay, how are you feeling about these pilots then? Because it sounds to me like, so is this going to be your proof of concept? Is this mm-hmm. going to be the first time you're actually trying out your ideas then? Or Yeah, it is. So yes. that must be a little bit nerve wracking. Yeah, it is. And now I've brought people on as well. I'm like, oh, hang on. 
I'm now managing three people. <laughs> <laughs> I have to make it work and I have to sound like I know what I'm talking about because before it was me talking to me. Yeah. So I didn't mind if I messed up, but now, yeah. yeah, I feel this responsibility to be like, wow, I've brought them on and I've said that, you know, you're going to be coming and working on a, on a real project that you mm. can then talk about in your dissertation or as your PhD or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's scary <laughs> uh, it, but that that's also I mean it must feel nice to have collaborators I know you had a collaborator before and you mm -hmm. were sort of engaging with stakeholders to kind of fund money so you had people getting involved in your idea but to now be working with you know a, a core group of people mm -hmm. who are sharing that idea yeah. that must be nice to have you know it's like there's more people around you taking part in this now that must be a nice feeling yeah it definitely is and I mean, even when I was interviewing them, I would, they're all so clever and they've all got so much passion behind them. For I mean, they don't necessarily study a subject that's related to this, but they have a passion for it outside of it. So it was really nice to talk to them and hear an outsider's opinion um, and still feel like they've come into the business and they really want what's best for the business, even though they haven't, they haven't been a part of it from the start, which... You know, like I was saying about when you're working for somewhere and you've got to learn it behind, learn the history of it yeah. to get that passion. I'm also now seeing it from the other point of view where I'm seeing them be really passionate about something that they haven't been with from the start. Yeah. It's, it's very strange, but it's nice. Nice to have a team. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so your pilots are for, what was it, six weeks, did you say? Yeah. So after that, it's data crunching, and then what's the next step after that? I saw on the website that you, one of the major things for this year is to secure your further funding. Yeah. Um, so are you working it in that you will take the data from your pilots mm -hmm. and go, this is what we can deliver, and that's going to help you with your funding, or are you not relying on that so much? Um, a bit of both. So we've got a few funding bids going in currently. So that's just on the basis of kind of funding the pilot a little bit more and potentially extra sessions um, if we can get the funding in for that. But yeah, I'm hoping that the data off the back of it will will help us with funding to say this is what we've already done. And we now want to develop the service rather than kind of seed funding or something for a Kickstarter. It's more yeah. we've done it. Now we want to expand. I mean, it sounds like data should have given you a lot of support as well and a lot yeah. of backing and that must mm -hmm. I mean that must feel nice as well to have the business kind of you know not just support you but encourage you definitely yeah I'm honestly so lucky because they're they're fantastic people to work with and work for and they have been nothing but supportive in this um when I first kind of saw it as maybe registering it as a business I had a chat with um, my bosses there and just said look this is an idea I've got I don't think it's um, competition you know it's not in the same area and it's also a social enterprise so it's not making profit um, or anything mm -hmm. like that but it is something that I'm really passionate about and it, it is realistically this is what I want to do full time they knew that about me anyway that the position that I was in I will give everything to my job but it's not something that I want to do long term and that's something that we've openly talked about mm -hmm. and that for me has took a massive weight off my chest not having to tiptoe around them if they ask mm -hmm. what I've been doing in the evening I don't have to say oh, nothing I wasn't yeah. working, you know, I wasn't interviewing people like, you know, it just <laughs> makes it so much more relaxed. And yeah, I think it's nice to have that mutual respect for each other. They know that whilst I'm in work, I'm focused on that. And when mm -hmm. I'm outside work, I've got my business and, and that's absolutely fine. Yeah, so I've been lucky, definitely. Yeah, we'll touch on Brexit briefly. So mm -hmm. is that going to have any effect or any effect that you know about? Like my guess would be um just for suppliers for tech equipment mm -hmm. might become more expensive for you but yeah. you also have you purchased any of that equipment yet or is it all being donated no i've not well i've purchased the odd like second hand headset just to test out and understand how it works a little bit more um but we haven't purchased any of the kit yet because i'm waiting on hopefully some of these funding bids that i'm putting in this week hopefully that will fund a little bit of the kit and if not, we've got the crowdfunder money. So I'm still waiting to figure out which kit we're using. That's one of one of my researchers is actually looking into uh, which we think is going to work best and be most suitable for the range of accessibility needs that we might come across. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we 
I have got one actually that was donated to us by the library just on a, a temporary basis. I'd put something out on Twitter and someone got back in touch and said, yeah, we've got a spare headset if you want to borrow it. So that's mm. been amazing just being able to try that out because they are quite pricey. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure in terms of Brexit. It's not something that I've actually looked into. Um, mm. But like you say, maybe the, the cost of equipment is going to go up. Um, but in terms of delivering the sessions, I don't see there being a massive change. It shouldn't possibly. really affect you. No, I think the only thing that we might come across is how families and people are feeling. Maybe there might mm. be more triggers. Um, I've just yeah. got to think about how um, society is affected by it and how that might trickle down into children that we're talking to and the, the issues yeah. that might be coming across in their personal life. You know, mm. if we run a workshop in school, we've just got to be aware that we don't know what's going on outside of school and that mm. there might be cultural barriers, there might be societal you know issues that are coming up so yeah I think it's more about the content I guess just tailoring it that and being aware of things. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the experiences that you're kind of designing so on the video that I watched where you mentioned your uh, bonfire night filming that you said didn't yeah. go very well yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about that why didn't it go very well what went what went wrong? Oh well for a start, we forgot that there is um, obviously a microphone attached to it. So we talked all the way through, which meant that we couldn't then be listening to the fireworks, which was part of it. Obviously, with the immersive experience, you want to have the sound and the visuals uh, where you yeah. can. Um, so the fact that at one point, I think I said, that one looks like a penis, um, probably isn't best for something that children age eight are going to be listening to. So we had to crop quite a few bits. And it was the first time we've used a camera. We borrowed it off someone. Like, we found a website where you can borrow equipment and just pay for however many days you use it. So we'd never used a 360-degree camera before. Um, we got it maybe two hours before we were going to go out filming. So we were still figuring it out. Um, and we didn't, yeah, it was just a bit a big learning curve. I think we probably should have tested it out a lot earlier than that. <laughs> but so... <I> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's what you want I mean the mm -hmm. first one of the first interviews I did had you know I've got two microphones set up and went to someone's house and put all the mics up and the recorder down and stuff and then forgot to turn my microphone on no. like well you know at least I've made that mistake early on <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> hopefully I won't do that again you know? no <laughs> oh, gosh <laughs> it's better to have the mistakes now I think yeah yeah, yeah, definitely. How did you find it then, you know, like getting the setup and stuff? Did you do a lot of research or did you did you talk to people that had done this previously or did you just kind of go out, get your kit and then learn as you went? I didn't talk to anyone. I did research in a kind of uh, piecemeal, piecemeal way. Like mm -hmm. I've said, I, I've said this in other interviews, but I, I kind of I take a bit of a weird approach where I'll, I'll kind of look at the theory and engage with all of that and then throw it out of the window and then just start <laughs> doing it and then realize that I should be doing all the stuff that I've read about but I think I need you know I think I need to go through that process so. yeah yeah you do I think that's the thing if you know that it's there at least you've got a choice if you want to do it or not but test it out yeah. you never know what's going to work for you exactly I mean I'm, at least I'm, I'm looking at the things and seeing how it should be done Mm -hmm. And then I, I think what I do is I make the adjustment in my head of like, OK, well, I'm going to do it this way because I'm just tweaking how it should be done. And then I realise that I should be doing more of what they say should be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but, it, you know, there's always something that you want to do your own way. So I think maybe what I'm doing is I'm trying to find my own way that yeah. way. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, and I think that's the thing when you start out in business as well. That's something that I found was everyone was so forthcoming with their advice and support. And that was so nice to know that people were happy to just give their time for free. Um, but on the flip side, it was quite hard having all those different opinions as to what you should do with your business. And it almost does get to a point where you think, OK, I really appreciate the support and the advice, but I just need to take myself away a little bit and just decide which ones I want to pursue now. And yeah. which ones I might want to push push away and, and come back to in a year's time. So, yes, yeah, so you've got to find your own way and what works for you. Definitely. Yeah, I would definitely mm -hmm. agree with that. So we've done a bit of Brexit. We've done, um, 
I mean, think, thinking about this in terms of the longer term future. So let's let's go through the kind of good steps. The pilot goes very well. You get your third year funding. Everything mm-hmm. is going along. You, you actually get the service up and running. You're getting out to people. Where does it go from there? Do you see it more as do you see more and more people being connected through the tech or do you is is there how are you building the communities outside of that and mm-hmm. so I, I what I'm thinking is I'm thinking about tech being kind of alienating as well in its own way yeah. it's like we all have these video cameras and phone mm-hmm. cameras so we can all call each other all around the world whenever and, and see yeah. spaces but it's also not the same it's mm-hmm. nice but and you know, I, I said again this yesterday that, um, you know, the first lockdown for me, there was a lot of phoning people, texting people, messaging yeah. people, like it was pretty constant and getting in touch with people that I hadn't been in touch with for a long time. Mm-hmm. Because this third lockdown has kind of been, yeah. <laughs> and not getting in touch with anyone. <laughs> and yeah, everyone's still miserable. Say. They've just not been in touch. Well, that's the other thing. It's like I've, you've nothing to say, and when yeah. you do say something, it eventually comes around to being like it's all bad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. it's like, let's just not have that conversation. Yeah. Uh, so how are you just focusing on the positive side, or is there any worry about that kind of alienation side of of tech? Like, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, I think it's a good point because there's lots of tech can be very isolating, and it's almost like you're giving your you're giving yourself an excuse not to connect in person with people because sometimes it's just easier and quicker to do it online. It's almost like a shortcut. Um, so there is that real worry that in the future, especially with kids now with social media, that they are almost reliant on digital and tech for everything and it is hard then to break them away from that and be like remember there's people and human beings and we can go outside and there's sunshine um but I'm hoping that I mean the the future of this service I guess in the next let's say maybe three years I'd like to be able to expand outside of Yorkshire which is where I'm just kind of focusing on now like Leeds and West Yorkshire is being able to have these hubs around the country so people are making content that's really relevant to that area so I want it to be very community driven and if we're talking to children in Leeds then we're showing them events and situations and locations in West Yorkshire stuff that they're familiar with so that if they are struggling with things like social anxiety we're almost bridging that gap between saying well we don't expect you to go all the way in and go to that museum with lots of people but why don't we try it in a virtual environment first see how you feel get familiar with it and then maybe take that step so it's kind of about it's almost like that bridge in between for anybody that's feeling uncomfortable going into a physical situation but there is a there is a worry in general that kids are just gonna be focused on the digital side and then think well what's the point in doing this in person because actually I can I can experience it online and actually it can be really enhanced because if we've got VR and we've got augmented reality we can have all these additional things that don't exist But then again, you know, I grew up with a Sega Mega Drive. We played lots of games and I still knew that you could go and play outside on your bike. So I think it's just the way that we offer these, give give kids a a choice and hopefully schools and and parents support that. Um, Mm. Yeah, it's a difficult one. I'm hoping that the service that I'm developing is going to help people to get back into the real world Mm. as it is if they are already outside of it. And if they're not outside of it, then this just kind of teaches them some life skills around mental health. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, if if nothing else, you know, at least at at the minimum, they will get an experience to break up their day and something enjoyable, you know, especially if you're stuck in hospital, you know, you've probably read all the books and watched the TV. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think the one we want to have small workshops. So in small groups, we'd said like eight to 10 kids per group. But we want it to be really collaborative and be able to say, well, you're all experiencing the same thing in the video. And then afterwards, let's talk about it because we want to be able to maybe make new friendships or give people a chance to discuss what they've experienced. So just very aware that if there's, for example, if there is children in hospital, 
and there's something going on outside, you know, Leeds City Centre, maybe there's Pride Parade going on and they can hear all of that and you know what's going on. They can see it out of the window, but they're not able to go and experience it. It was almost yeah. the thought behind it when I first got into the business and thought, yeah, I can't imagine how those kids feel. Mm. How can we bring that outside world in? Um, so it's not necessarily saying that this is better or a replacement for that, but when times are tough, here's something that's a little bit of, of relief yeah. just to bide your time until you can get back into that situation. It is, is one of the difficult. So as you've described it through the course of this uh, interview, it sounds like it's going to be quite capital intensive because especially if it's multi-site and you've got, you know, you need to have some sort of um, safeguarding Mm-hmm. Um, you need the you need the content for the experience to be created and then mm-hmm. delivered and distributed. There's a lot of logistical work in it, yeah. and I know that this pilot will sort of highlight that and let you iron out some of the 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 issues with it. But have you had any people, anyone trying to discourage you and make it cheaper and sort of couldn't you make this? less of an experience and why does it have to be done this way you know why can't Mm -hmm. we do fuzzy felt or something (laughs) (laughs) love some fuzzy felt Um, (laughs) I guess not not yet but I do see that happening coming up in the future purely because like the pilot is is free so we haven't necessarily decided on a on a pricing model we've got an idea of what we want to do with it but I've not made any decisions on that yeah, I think there will be, I mean, it will come at a big cost. And like you say, logistically, it will be very difficult because there's only so many places I can be that I'm going to have to develop the team yeah. and I'm going to have to spread out those tasks and, and actions that need doing. Yeah, I've not come up against it yet. Have you any fears of, of delegating? Or are you quite confident that people, you, you know, you're not one of those people who's starting their own business of like, it, it must be done this way and I can't <laughs> trust anybody else because they'll do it wrong no of course not I'm I'm super chill <laughs> no yeah I, I will be a little bit of a control freak I'm not gonna lie um I think just especially starting out the first time that I'm gonna have to open up a hub or somewhere in a city where I can't be there every day I think that will be really difficult for me just to be like okay it's fine like they're involved in the business because they care about it we've got the same values obviously I'll have talked to them first so be like you know Hopefully we're on the same on the same page and we want best for the company and, and the kids that we're helping. But I think there will be points where I'll be like, I just wish I was there to see if it was all OK. So that will yeah. be a big learning curve for me because I am I am a bit of a control freak. <laughs> um, do you have a plan like a schedule? I, I'm thinking like a TV schedule of like these are the programs mm-hmm. that we're going to run. So if you kind yeah. of design are each of the pilots, are they running the same program or are they each different experiences? Um, this pilot is going to run the same one. I did originally want three different videos of three different themes, but yeah. because of COVID, we've just not been able to do any filming. So yeah. we're quite restricted on what we can pull together by April. So I've just yeah. said, right, we're going to scrap that. We'll just do the same workshop in, in three different organisations with two different age groups and just run it the same. And then we'll just see what happens April, May as to whether we can go and do some filming and as soon as we can we'll start to build a bit of a library of, of themes because um, there's things like the bonfire night, which I was really looking forward to last year, really hoping that things were going to open back up and I'd get to redo everything that I missed up, messed up the year before. Yeah. Um, and then there was things like Santa's Grotto and loads of things going on at Christmas, yeah. illuminations, loads of lights. So it was all these fantastic stuff that I was looking forward to filming and obviously none of them happened parades carnivals through summer so I'm hoping that this year we're going to have a little bit more flexibility and we're going to be able to go and grow that content and then develop workshops that are based on that on the video yeah Yeah. cool so are you planning to do like all the design for the content is going to be done in-house I would actually I'd really like to collaborate with other people on that I think it'd be quite nice to be able to say these are a few of our workshops and then here's one where we collaborated with this company or we're talking about this theme or you know have have things to do with culture cultural differences so if there's um, celebrations that are related to a specific religion or specific country it'd be really nice to be able to incorporate that and just recognize that we've got a really multicultural 
community in every city mm. um so make sure that we're thinking about that as well but at the minute with the with the pilot that we're designing we i'm actually working with leeds beckett students as well all right so they're, they've got a drama and creative writing course that has, I think, five or six students on that course. And as part of one of the modules to do with social, like acting for social purposes, mm-hmm. they're going to design the session. So I've basically given them a brief of kind of what I would like, but they're going to design like a drama piece that's going to be incorporated into the workshop. So right. it's quite nice to be able to say like, yes, I'm not old, but maybe you're slightly closer to the age we're going for like what fun and exciting things would you want to see in this because I've only got a certain amount of ideas and I'd really like other people's input and to say you know what you bring something to the table and if let's try it let's have some fun and see if it works and then hopefully you know as we as we meet children and young people I'm hoping to kind of develop a bit of a youth panel so that Mm -hmm. we can talk to exactly the demographic that we're going for and say you're you're 11 what yeah. would you want us to do? Because I've talked to my little brother who's 11 and I've told mm. him the idea of the business and he was like, I don't think you should do that. I think you should create flying backpacks. And I was like, well, that's really nice, but that's not, I don't know anything about that. So, you know, you can trust them to be really honest. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, they need to be calling the shots because they're the one using the service. So yeah. we'll see. It'll be a, definitely collaborations is in the future, I think. Okay, this is this was just for my own curiosity. Like when you when you're doing the pilot for the the review, are you going to be like filming the kids and their experience? You know, like their their review of the experience, or is it all going to be pen and paper? I'm hoping to record it. Yeah, I mean, we'll yeah. we'll see in terms of we've got obviously they'll need to be signed off by themselves and their parents as to whether they're they're happy to be filmed. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it would be quite nice to be able to to see that and show I the rest think... of the team as well. Yeah, I think you'll you'll probably get some priceless stuff in that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm definitely gonna go in there with my walls up a little bit and not take things yeah. to heart because I think if I go in and I'm like, this is my baby, please don't say anything bad about it. And then I've got a load of eight year olds that are like, this is crap. Yeah. <laughs> I need to keep it together (laughs) so yeah I'm gonna have to work on that I'm gonna have to work on my poker face and be like okay yeah why do you think that rather than be like no you're wrong I've been working for two years on this (laughs) what do you know you're not even 10 yet (laughs) yeah like fine you're not coming again I'm not inviting you (laughs) this service isn't for you (laughs) (laughs) so yeah I think that's gonna be really exciting um Mm. Um, yeah but then you're back to the hard work of chasing the money again Mm -hmm. Um, is that going like my thinking is I don't know if you're thinking the same thing but you you know you've kind of done a round of funding you've Mm -hmm. got that experience now you know what you're doing with it and now you'll have like more evidence in your back pocket Mm -hmm. are you are you thinking and and hoping that this will be an easier round hard to say because you can't you don't want to jinx yourself either (laughs) yeah like oh no what if I don't get anything um (laughs) I think it's just really different I think it I think when we did the crowdfunder it was almost like okay if this doesn't work then it's totally on on me and Mm -hmm. my co-director was working uh, with us at the time so there was a lot of pressure on us to come across and represent the company as well because it almost felt like people are really investing in us not even necessarily the business you know our family and friends are investing in in us and what we're saying we're going to do so it was quite personal whereas when I'm doing funding applications I'm very aware that they've never met me and they might never you know some of them you have to do a video submission and so they get to see a little bit of your personality but it's really different having to write it down and feel like you've got everything across and then your passion across whereas when we were doing the crowdfunder we did lots of videos we did lots of panels and we really put ourselves out there and tried to say like look where we're a part of this business and you're investing in us personally in doing what we say we're going to do um so yeah I don't know in my in my head they're they're totally different um But yeah, we'll just have to see, I guess, when we get some feedback from from some of them. Hopefully some will be successful. There'll definitely be ones that are unsuccessful, but hopefully that comes with feedback where I can think, right, we'll change it up and do something different. I've got another chance. The crowdfunder just felt like this was my one. It's like if I'm going to go through yeah. this five weeks of really intense stuff, 
I don't think I could do it again. If it had been unsuccessful, that would have really, really broken my heart, I think. Whereas this, yeah. I feel a little bit more like, okay, we'll go on to the next one and we'll just learn from it and do it differently next time. Yeah. Mm. yeah no, that's good. It's, and it sounds like you've been quite fortunate with the way that things have, have, have kind of happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask as well, how, so on rounds of funding, mm-hmm. um, I mean, this could have been pre-lockdown as well, but have you had to do sort of video pitches as well to people then? Yeah, there's one that I've recently applied for, which you had to do a three minute. Yeah, yeah. no, no, you had to keep it under two minutes um, for that one. And then previous one that I was unsuccessful on, you had to do a three minute video and a, a written submission. So you get a little bit of both. Is that better or worse than, you know, meeting an executive in their office? Because I suppose, you know, you only have that moment you're going into the video, you either have to record it or you, you do it there and then. Mm-hmm. But it's done and you're in your own home kind of thing. Whereas if you're seeing someone, well, you are seeing someone face to face. Yeah. But you have to wait and you have to wait to see them and then you have to meet them. <laughs> yeah. is, there, is it better doing it in the video way or is it better to meet people in the flesh? I've never had to do it in the flesh, you know. All right, okay. Then, uh, yeah, I've not had to experience that just yet. Um, obviously, I've, I've talked to people in person about it, but I've not had to worry about the funding side face to face yet. But I'm really bad at making videos. Mm. Really terrible at it. Like, if I have to make a two minute video, I think I had something like seven hours of of videos on my phone. I'd had to take every all my apps and everything off my phone just to make enough room to be able to keep recording myself, and then mm. having to watch yourself back. Yes. just you just feel even more anxiety about what you've said I feel like I just need to go in there get it over with and if it messes up then that's the way it is you try it yeah. and you learn from it you try again. on to the next one yeah yeah but with videos yeah I will I will sit for hours and hours and just keep recording the same thing so yeah I'm not very good at that <laughs> no but that's good for your pitch I mean at least you you know the, the more you rehearse your pitch the the, the the better it gets, you know, mm, you get quicker definitely. and quicker and deliver it, delivering it and so on. Yeah. Um, and you and you really internalise it as well because coming up with those pictures or coming up with ways to describe it is difficult in and of itself because you don't really know because it's not there yet. You know, you're creating <laughs> something out of nothing. Like yeah. it's this thing, it's nothing at the moment. But what it will be. Is, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's really strange. And someone that I talked to right at the beginning when I'd first registered the business and said, like, oh, I don't know how to, when I go into a room and talk about it, what should I say? And they said, just talk about it like it's already a thing. It's already a successful business. This is what you're doing, rather than saying, well, this is what we're planning on doing. Mm. But then I'd go in there and be like, this is what we're doing. They're like, all right. And then I'd ask a question. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know yet. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'd only learn. I just practiced that one sentence. <laughs> I don't actually know anything about the business <laughs> or the industry I'm going into so yeah I had to change my tactics there but yeah it is hard because I'm just like oh we're in this phase now where I, I don't have all the answers but I'm a bit more comfortable with admitting that now. So you you uh INC360 is a CIC the mm-hmm. interest company is that yeah. right? Is yeah. yeah uh so you need an asset lock for that Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm guessing that's all the tech that yeah. you be acquiring for it um, and I'm guessing you know you, you've chosen for you it's essentially a social enterprise it's something mm-hmm. that will make money and pay you but it's not just there to to make money yeah um, so how long was the thinking in regards to how you would incorporate um, did you know straight away that you were going to go down the CIC route or did you kind of have to come to that through reading around or? I did a little bit of research into it. I hadn't heard about it before and I, I'd heard about social enterprises and I thought, right, well, I, I definitely want it to be community based. I almost started it originally just thinking I would love it to be a full time job, but the reason for it is to give something to the community. So I was I was quite behind it being a not for profit or a charity or something, just third sector. So I started having a bit of a research. Uh, I found a couple of websites where you could give them a call and they'd give you half an hour of advice and just explain, yeah. you know, the various setups. Um, and I think it might have even been when I called a bank to ask about their um, community groups and community um, 
like bank accounts that you could set up for charities and and community mm-hmm. groups. And I, I had a bit of a chat with them and said, like, this is this is my idea. I don't really know what bank account I should set up with, and I don't know how to set up my business. Mm-hmm. And it was someone on the phone that said, look, if you if you want to go into funding and you want in grants. Um, and you're going to be quite reliant on that, especially to start with. Then I would set it up as a CIC limited by guarantee because that's more appealing to funders. And it also is what you're describing in that you want to give something back to the community. And whilst it needs to make profit to make it sustainable, that's not your main focus is to make money off this business. So yeah. it was, yeah, it was just the advice that I'd found online. And then this person that I talked to that explained it in that way that I thought, yeah, that's that is what I want. Um, so yeah, just went and, and registered it then as a CIC. Because yeah. mm-hmm. I looked at CIC and because I didn't like I I want to make money out of this, but I didn't necessarily yeah. like I I wanted it to be kind of community based. I mean, mm-hmm. this podcast is to a degree, but then the the business, other business side of it, I wanted to have you know to work with communities, community groups, and things like that to do stuff. And to work with corporate clients as well, but Mm -hmm. to do stuff of more people who were interested, but didn't, you know, they weren't going to go and sit down and do loads and loads of research. They just want to ring someone up who's like, can you do this? Can you show us how to do that kind of thing? Yeah. So I I looked at CITs, but you needed, you you can't just register it yourself. You need somebody else on there as Mm -hmm. well. And you need the asset lock. And I'd I'd met someone, um, I did like a week volunteering on a permaculture thing and mm-hmm. they'd set up a CIC and they said that I mean obviously this won't but they just said that winding it down was a real pain for them and um, right. it was like it was it, it, it kind of did what it needed to do but it didn't have a long-term life for them yeah and then they said winding it down was difficult so that's why I went kind of limited com- company route yeah I didn't look at um actual social enterprises but you can you can register as a social enterprise can't you yeah can I you so. i don't know what i'm trying to think what the letters would be you know you have like lt yeah LT limited and company and or LC, yeah yeah i'm trying to think of what the social enterprise one would be but you must be able to register as that but i'm just mm. not sure how or if it's under the same like on the same bit where you just choose how you want to register it or you've got to apply for something separately mm. yeah sure, and there's the there's the um you heard of b corporations yeah but i'm not 100 percent certain i understand what what they are yeah they're sort of they'd like social enterprises but not quite right. uh, but again i couldn't like when i was looking at you know for setting up the business i couldn't really find anything on them I don't know if they're just an American thing or um... yeah I think they're like almost like an add-on I think you can be a company and then become a B corporation but I think you have to do specific oh it's like a certification yeah Yeah, yeah, we're giving back yeah we're we're in business and we're in business to make money but we're doing these cool and groovy things as well yeah yeah I think that's it in terms of my question. You've kind of covered safeguarding issues for the kids. We've covered the content creation. We've covered your other jobs. We've done a bit of the future. Um, I'm looking at my kind of prompt cards to see if anything's jumping <laughs> out of me. That, that's one. I've, I noticed ecology on here. So just from your sustainability side, what's mm-hmm. how's that looking? Because you're going to be quite tech reliant there. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that you can do on that front or is that anything you've considered or what's the thinking around that at the moment? Honestly, it's not something that I've considered. Um, It's something that I would like to. But yeah, I think... No, it's it's not something that I've considered, actually. Mm. Yeah, I probably should, going forward, have a little bit more of an idea of how how it's going to impact that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's difficult to see where you could have savings. I suppose, you know, having energy efficient equipment and, mm. you know, trying to reduce the amount that it needs to travel around. Like, ideally, mm-hmm. is your thinking that you will have, like, you know, when you said you'll have a presence, 
So mm-hmm. would it be an office, like an office somewhere near a hospital, or you would ideally want some presence in a hospital, or how are you trying to plan think, that? Mm, probably outside of the hospital, I guess, like a bit of a yeah co-working space or a bit of an office with with the kit and you know maybe a couple of members of staff there. Mm-hmm. And then they're just able to travel out to places within that city or that region to go deliver the workshops and obviously content create there. The only thing I guess that I can think of that we might be able to help nature is if we were to do a theme around going to a, a communal garden or something like that and teaching kids about how to, I don't know, grow their own food or plant things and give something back. I mean, equally, you know, from yeah. a green perspective, you are creating community you're locally Mm. focused um you know it's not like you're it's not like not not to I'm not having a go at them but it's not like you make a wish and you're sort of like let's fly a kid to to Disneyland or whatever like let let's give kids let give that kid an experience of Disneyland here so you don't have to fly them there so in that way you are you know you are reducing impact and you're creating Mm -hmm. community and you're you know you're involved in health so you're healing Mm -hmm. so obviously those people when they get well and they'll go on to be useful productive nice members of society so (laughs) yeah that's a a positive yeah it is a massive positive I need you in meetings with me um (laughs) I need to be like hang on a minute Simon's gonna tell you (laughs) it's good because of this and this and this yeah (laughs) but listen to this podcast I did (laughs) Some really good ideas. Yeah. Okay, so that's episode one. If you like it, I hope you come back for more. As I said in the intro, there are four more shows to come. And I think they are as good. I can't be the only person that finds listening to other people's chats interesting. I can't be the only person that is interested in hearing straight from the worker's mouth. Hearing about work struggles, hearing about good employers and bad employers, hearing the horror stories and inspiring tales. I mean, most of us spend most of our life in work. We give most of our time not to people we love and care for, but to strangers. I think that that is fascinating. I think we give far too much time to spaceships and superheroes, much as I love both, and to posh kids who went to drama school and are getting paid for playing poor and having affairs on our TV shows. We just don't spend nearly enough time discussing where we are most of the time and what we are actually doing there. Why do we do it? How do we feel about it? And I want to play some part in changing that, changing those discussions. I'm dropping the fortnightly release schedule from last year because that's rubbish. I hate shows that do it. I just did it because I wanted to stretch out my 10 episodes at the end of last year. It was silly and I apologise for that. I want this show to be twice a week if and when I can get it up to speed. Remember, with this show I want to ask 1,000 loiners over the 2020s the second question that everybody asks everybody. What do you do? So if you are a loiner or you know a loiner, get in touch or tell them to get in touch and hashtag tell me about it leads. Also, as subtle is about as effective as any efforts to create useful change through so-called democratic politics, I will state clearly here. You don't have to be born in Leeds to be on the show. And if you were born in Leeds, but you aren't based in Leeds anymore, you can also be on the show. If you got any value from any of this, consider doing the like, share and subscribe thing. If you're a loiner, then seriously, please be my guest on the show. It's not scary. I'm reasonably nice. And I'm more than happy for you to disagree with all of my bullshit. That's fine. I want the show to be about leads, not me. I want my guests to change me, to change my opinions. I want to learn from them, from you. What do you do, leads? Tell me about it. Go to western-studios.com forward slash b hyphen on hyphen a hyphen podcast for more info or just email working hours pod at western hyphen studios.com with a brief little bio and some ideas about your availability please also let me know if you wish to be anonymous that is an option have you signed an nda do you need to whistleblow i'm all for it i take my lead from you if you want to record yourself at a point in your career if you're lucky enough to have a career and you don't want your interview to be published right now that's fine we can do that you have the final say on your interview. You can follow the show on Twitter at Western Studios 2 and on Instagram, Western underscore Studios underscore Leads. I will spin off those channels so that they eventually become just Western Studios channels and I will be creating a, a dedicated channel on each of those platforms for this show. You can support this show, support me with a one-off donation on Kofi. that's K-O-F-I 
hyphen fi.com forward slash working hours or at buymeacoffee.com forward slash western studios you can give me as much or as little as you like there but if you really want to help and you're minted enough to give this show more regular support you should of course subscribe and help it to last out this decade it's a pound a month at patreon so that's www patreon.com forward slash working hours pod if you can give more then please do i just want the patreon to be as affordable as possible to as many people as possible this may be for and about leads but everywhere in the world there is someone that cares about leads because we get everywhere a quick final point before i sign off i said in the last intro that i would be re-recording the intros from volume one i am not going to do that now i will be adding transcripts and time codes in due course to all episodes and i have updated the show notes on volume one I do want to get my production process for this show into shape this year so that all episodes will be ready and up to standard as and when they are published. That's it. Go do something amazing today. The Working Hours podcast is made by Western Studios Leeds. It is presented and produced by Simon Treen. This interview was recorded over Skype. Thank you to Captivate.fm for podcast hosting. The Working Hours theme was provided by Australian-based lawyer DJ Punk. You can hear more from Punk at soundcloud.com forward slash big time punk. If you're in Leeds and have a podcast idea that you would like to develop, please email makemypodcast at western-studios.com with some details about what you would like to achieve and let's start making your podcast a reality today. Follow Western Studios on Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. That's linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash Western Studios. There you'll find sporadic news on new episodes of Working Hours and for new original podcast productions that will be coming soon from Western Studios Leagues. You can also go directly to the website for Western Studios, which is www.western-studios.com.